Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kim Mabry, Program Manager here at Interfaith Ministries for Greater Houston in the Department of Interfaith Relations and Community Partnerships. And on behalf of myself, our President and CEO, Martin Kaminsky, and my colleagues here on the call, we just thank you all for joining us and registering for today's program. Today is the fifth and final uh, discussion in our vital conversations with our community series. Today's subject is a season of caring, mental health and the holidays. And our conversation is with two of our community educators, one who works with faith leaders and one who works with health professionals. And they're gonna teach us about how to manage anxiety and navigate family dynamics and respond to the continued stress that we are all under with COVID in our midst. And as we all are coming together again, many of us for the first time in about two years with our family and friends for holiday gatherings. So there's a lot of anxiety wrapped in that. And so we're happy to provide this service for you today. Interfaith Ministries is pleased to be able to host these virtual conversations and this series of vital conversations with our community on topics with people and organizations around the greater Houston area. We offer thanks for the support of this series from Sitco Petroleum Corporation as the sponsor of our entire 2021 Vital Conversations series. Now, before I proceed, I just want to give everybody a reminder that this event is being recorded and then to just thank all of you for joining us on Zoom. Please keep yourselves muted and please make sure you use the chat box and send any questions you may have um, to me. I'll be reading the questions and then posing those to our guests. Our Vital Conversations series, if this is your first time joining us, please know that this series emerged after the death of George Floyd, a son of Houston's third ward in May of 2020 in Minneapolis where he was killed. In June, we brought our three amigos, Reverend Bill Lawson, Archbishop Joe Fior Di Fiorenzo, and Rabbi Sam Karf into the dialogue to begin this series. Unfortunately, it would be the final time that the three amigos would be together in the same space as Rabbi Kark died shortly after that conversation in August. Since that first discussion, we have hosted two seasons and seven conversations with many amazing people and organizations in our community. And you can visit and refresh yourself with these dialogues that have already happened at our website, www.imgh.org, to listen to all of these past vital conversations and to learn more about all the work that we do here at Interfaith Ministries. And the program you hear today will be up shortly after we edit and have time to post it on our website so you can go back or spread the word to your friends and let them join in on what they missed. Now we're going to start today's conversation. Um, I'm going to introduce you to our guests. And again, this is the last in our series for 2021. And to close out this year, we are focusing on what we are all dealing with. And we've heard from a lot of you in the community about things that we're, that, that we're all stressed about. And so maintaining our mental health, managing anxiety, navigating family dynamics, and responding to the ongoing stress of COVID is something we hear from all of our friends out in the community a lot. And so we thought this was a great way to close out the year before we start 2022. Now to help us navigate this very vital topic, we welcome our two guests. The first is Dr. Ken Schumann. He has been a student of family systems theory for more than 20 years and teaches family systems at Houston Graduate School of Theology, where he is a professor of pastoral leadership. Ken is also the leader of a ministry called Faith Walking. Faith Walking helps individuals apply systems thinking in a practical way so that they grow in emotional maturity. Ken gets to practice these principles with his wife, Becky, and his two grown daughters, and with his large extended family. So thank you, Ken, for being with us. And also our second guest is Ms. Akima Taylor. She comes to us as a former student of Dr. Schumann and a registered nurse for over 20 years. After many years in the hospital setting, Akima now works for Community Health Choice, an extension of Harris Health. 
systems, and Ms. Taylor has a vast practical working knowledge of passing along all her wisdom and the things she's learned in Dr. Schumann's class and other classes and teaching others the skills of managing anxiety as she educates clinical and non-clinical health professionals on best practices in managing patient populations, living with the stressful conditions of chronic diseases such as asthma, diabetes, heart failure, and mental health disorders. Akima has been married to her lifelong love of 25 years, and they are the proud parents of three children, Lindsay, Alexis, Alexandria, and one grandson. So Dr. Schumann and Akima, we welcome you both, and thank you for being a part of this discussion. Now, before we dive into the program, I just want to make sure that all of you have your worksheet out in front of you. I emailed that to all of you last night, but or if you don't have it with you or you can't find it, please just send your email in the chat box and we will get that email to you um, shortly. So just look for that. And if you don't already have it in front of you, bring it up on your screen or print it out because it's just got a lot of great tools and um, kind of triggers for questions that you might want to ask. So again, I remind you to pose any questions in the chat box and then I'll give those to our guests. So uh, Dr. Schumann and Akima, let's just dive right in and ask the question that is fostered by the title of our program, which is what are the primary causes of anxiety during this holiday season? Dr. Schumann? Yeah, uh, thank you for having me. I am so glad to be here and so glad to be partnering with my friend Akima. And uh, so there are a variety of answers to the question. What are the main causes of anxiety? Uh, we're going to highlight so many. I, I hope we don't overwhelm uh, the group with just all of the, the vastness of it. Uh, so one of the reasons we get anxious in the holidays is, is we have high expectations that other people are going to be different than they are. And when they aren't different than they are, we get anxious and we get reactive. And we can go into much more detail uh, around that. Uh, I think a couple of other things. I think during the holidays, we have a propensity to say yes to too many things. And we get exhausted and we get and we get run down and and that makes us anxious because we've got one more party to go to or one more gift to go by or or whatever. And one of the other things about anxiety or causes for anxiety that I want to highlight today is often the holidays are not exciting and fun times for people because they've lost significant others in their life. And the holidays are a time that reminds them of that. And, they, and we get anxiety around our grieving uh, and around our sense of loss. And so today, I, I hope that all of us will recognize that if you have anxiety during the holidays, for whatever reason, you're not alone, that there are a whole lot of us that are going to have anxiety, and that there are some tools we can use uh, to, to help us with that. Akima, what would you add to that list? I would I would add that um, everything that you said is absolutely relevant. It is a tough time. And I think the first part of that is really acknowledging that part of it, right? To deny it or to try and escape over, it just causes more what we call anxiety, right? And so um, focusing in on how you feel about those situations or if you have a feeling about those situations. Am I buying too many gifts, right? Um, if you're an introvert or you're a commander, they say your personality, they say, you know, buying too many gifts, that's not even your thing. You'd rather just give a gift card or tell them what to get <laughs> or move on. So understanding what you have inside you absolutely on top of what you said is key to beginning, at least before we begin the rest of the, the season. Thank you, Akima. And, you know, on everybody, if you have your worksheet, um, you'll notice that Dr. Schumann has provided us with these great um, just outline of how we manifest anxiety. And Dr. Schumann, if you would kind of talk through some of these with us on the what are the typical ways that we react to anxiety? Yeah, uh, thank you, Kim. Let, let me lay a foundation for that by saying what I believe is that all of us in our first formation and in, in those first 17 years of our lives were we had needs that went unmet 
or we got wounded in some ways and we learned ways of protecting ourselves as children. And those were appropriate when we were eight, nine, 10, even 12, 13 years old. Those were really appropriate ways of protecting ourselves. But those ways of protecting ourselves became the habit of our life. And now we get triggered around those things. And our triggers cause anxiety. And when we get triggered, what we end up doing is showing up in one of typically these five ways. So w one way is, is by conflicting. So we, we want to argue or we want to debate or we want to get really intense and, and verbally belittle or shame other people uh, or, or we talk about them behind their backs or uh, whatever. But, but recognizing that conflict is one of the ways that we, we react to anxiety. A second way of, act, of reacting to anxiety is distancing. And we can distance emotionally. So that's when you just shut down and you, and you just close off inside. I'm, I'm, man, I'm, I'm great at that, by the way. Uh, or we might physically distance. Uh, you might say, and, and the ultimate form of distancing is cut off, where you say, hey, I've had enough of you. I'm just going to cut off. I'm just leaving. I'm, I'm getting out of here. I'm not going to talk to you again because you generate too much anxiety in my life. Um, uh, so cut off is three. Four is over and under functioning. And those are reciprocal, which means that whenever there is a person that is over functioning, there will always be a person that gets to under function. And we might, we might trade places. So the overfunctioner may suddenly quit overfunctioning and, and start underfunctioning, and the underfunctioner starts overfunctioning, and we play, we play this game or we have this dance back and forth. And then the final uh, way that we react to anxiety is by triangling, where we bring another person in and we involve them in our anxiety. Sometimes we call that venting, and we just we we just we bleed all over them, or we or we just we throw all of our anxiety all over them, and we feel better once we get it off our chest, but we haven't resolved the issue. So those are kind of the five different ways. And what I want to say to all of you is, as I've uh, in my own life, I've learned that I do all five of those depending on my role and my relationship. So if I'm in a leadership position, conflict is a, a lot easier for me. Uh, in my marriage, I tend to be an overfunctioner. Uh, I triangle regularly and but but I have one that's kind of my standard go-to, and my standard go-to is distancing. So when I get anxious, I start shutting down. I start withdrawing. I might physically move away. Uh, and Akima, I know you identify with distancing, so talk to us about that a little. Absolutely. That you you called it out. That's that's my target right there. <laughs> uh, my go to is distancing. I'm I'm much better than I was before. I must say, right? This is not a destination, but it is a it's a, it's a journey, right? Mm -hmm. I'm better today than I was two years ago. But you're absolutely right. My go to is um, to feel anxious, right? Um, understand there's a problem and to avoid um, going off, snapping, losing it, having conversations I shouldn't have, I shut down in distance, right? But this is what I've learned in this journey over two years also. I'm not really conflict. I'm not really. I didn't think that I was. I'm, I'm not going to throw my hands around or, or, or anything like that. N not initially. I'm my go-to. But do you know what I learned was conflict? Sarcasm. <laughs> ah, I was wondering why people got upset when I got sarcastic, right? <laughs> but so in the last two years, I've worked really hard to, you know, just cut out the cynicism, cut out the sarcasm and either answer the question yes or no. But when I'm tired and I'm lazy and I just don't find it, it's almost like a second language sometimes, right? But yeah. it does cause conflict in situations where there is anxiety for sure. Yeah.
Can I ask you both, you know, early when I was introducing the two of you, Ken, for you in particular, I use the term family systems. And mm -hmm. so we, you've done a lot of, of explaining and talking without really labeling what you just were talking about as family systems. Can you kind of connect mm -hmm. those dots for us? What was it that you said that relates to family systems? And if you can kind of put that in a nutshell. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, great question. Let me try to put it in a nutshell. Right. Uh, <laughs> so, That's heavy. So systems are about holes. They're about how all the parts function together. And so family systems are about how do we all interact with our with our families or or at work with the people at work because the people at work work like a family system. Okay. And, and when we talk about family systems, one of the principles of family systems is, is anxiety and how anxiety runs through a system. So here's, here's the thing to re remember at the holidays, anxiety is contagious. When one person in a system, whether that be the family or at church or at work or or with your friends gets anxious, that anxiety is contagious and others take on the anxiety. And pretty soon uh, these five ways that we react, everybody's reacting out of their way of anxiety. What I would say also to you is, and this is really important. Most of the time when people don't behave the way you want them to behave, it's not that they're bad people. It's that they're anxious people. Uh. So the reason they are behaving when you go home for Christmas dinner, or if that's what you do, or when you gather with friends, if people behave in ways that, that are unpleasing to you, often it's going to be about their own anxiety. Mm -hmm. So anxiety is contagious, but, but here's an important principle, but so is calmness. Mm -hmm. And so if I can manage my own anxiety within myself, and become a, what we call a less anxious presence. So notice I don't run, I don't distance, I don't cut off, I stay present, but I manage my own anxiety and become less anxious. For me, those are kind of, uh, that, that's a beginning place for understanding anxiety within a family systems con con context, Kim. Is that the same thing? I've, I remember hearing the term being self-differentiated. Is that the same mm -hmm. thing? It, it is not exactly the same thing, but self-differentiation is, is a principle of family systems. And self-differentiation is, our level of self-differentiation is impacted by our anxiety. So self-differentiation is when I can show up with anybody in my life and be completely who I am, mm. show up as completely me, while at the same time, allowing them to be completely them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I'm telling you, that's hard, and, and, it's, and it takes growth, and it takes practice. Akima alluded to this just a moment ago, group. Mm -hmm. uh, the only way we get better is through practice. And, and if I may say, say a couple of things, and, and then I'm going to, Akima, get ready, because I'm about to pass the baton to you. <laughs> but uh, so we practice managing anxiety. We practice recognizing anxiety. And this is a saying that I, that I love to use. And unfortunately, with this kind of work, it's internal and it's personal, and it's with other people. So it's practice. But the practice is all done in public. I can't go hide in a closet and practice managing my anxiety. I've got to do it with people because it's the people that make me anxious. All right. The, the, I, my anxiety gets stirred up. And so here's a little phrase. All practice is in public. Oh, wow. And therefore, all practice is imperfect. That's good. That's great. <laughs> so. We so need to add that to the worksheet. <laughs> don't, don't beat yourself up when you go home at Christmas or where, where, when you're with whomever you're going to be with and you get anxious and, and you're practicing, recognize it's just practice. And you know what? You might not be have a good day of practice that day. Yeah. That's okay. It, it's not about perfection. 
And there is that old adage, practice makes perfect. Here, here's, I don't believe that. Practice makes progress. Oh, wow. And it's the progress that we're after. Akima, dive in on that and help us I, flesh that out a little bit. I guess I would have to go for self-differentiation on this one, right? We talked about this very recently, you and I, Ken. Um, we talked about um, uh, being who you are, right? Understanding mm -hmm. who you are, understanding your stance on issues, Right. Mm -hmm. And your stance is just your stance. You don't need a co-signer for it. You don't need anybody mm -hmm. to agree with it per se. And again, we're practicing. I might have a stance this way, but if I learn something new tomorrow, then my stance may change. But then again, it's mine. And you said this is the key, Ken. You said, and they have the chance to be self-differentiated. I get to let them be who they mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. Right. They don't right. have to believe like I believe. They don't have to say like I have to say. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the, the more I'm able to control my anxiety with disagreeing with someone mm -hmm. or the more I have to control my anxiety when someone is disappointing or what mm -hmm. I thought they should have mm -hmm. done, signing those silent contracts. Right. I expect <laughs> them to do A, B and C. And they had mm -hmm. no idea that they were even up for that. Right. Right. All of that internal work. Now, I begged Dr. Schumann at one point, can we please just do this in private? I mean, it, 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 <laughs> I, right. but in public is where it happens and you are absolutely right thank you for bringing that to the front point um it, you will get it wrong my rear view yeah. mirror is the best view in this situation my rear view yeah. mirror has 2020 i can adjust <laughs> and say ah, i should have done that differently and i give yeah. myself a lot of grace with getting it wrong today or half right or i got it better right today than i did yesterday or you know what today i just bombed out i lost it in a meeting i lost mm -hmm. it with my friend my family forgive myself and, tr and try again tomorrow. Yeah. If, if it's okay, let me tell a story uh, of what that looks like. Um, so my, my mom is still alive. She's 92 years old. And uh, she's seen a lot of life in 92 years. And I love my mom. She's still w really with it in, uh, mentally and intellectually. And in, in this past election cycle, my mom, one day we went to visit her and my mom said, well, well, I want to talk about the election. And the minute she said that my anxiety just spiked right through the top of my head because, because I know my mother thinks about things politically different than I think about things politically. And, uh, and, and, and I don't want to get in an argument with my mom and I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to react out of my anxiety with conflict. And so I said to my mom, I said to her, now, mom, you need to understand that I see politics and the political environment different than you do. And I just want you to know that in advance. And, and my mother said this in return. She said, yeah, I know you do. But she said, you're the only one that I can have a calm conversation with oh, about wow. this. Because everybody else in the family gets too anxious about it. Well, I was thankful she said that. And by the way, she overstated it because I was still anxious and, <laughs> and my anxiety was still, still there. But we were able to create some space where, where she was able to ask questions and I was able to tell her some things. And we got to a place where we just agreed to disagree, but we both respected one another in that. And, and, and so I think that's what it looks like. I also want to say, and I've been working on this stuff for a long time in my life, and I'm st I've still got anxiety. I, I said this to Kim just earlier, and I want to say it here. The goal is not to get rid of all of the anxiety in our, in our lives, because I think that's impossible. The goal is, can I manage my anxiety so that I become less anxious and can I show up as the person I want to show up as, as the best version of myself while I'm anxious? That's the goal. And, and that's where the practice is. So all of these five ways of reacting to anxiety are, are the ways that I show up when I'm not at my best. So when I'm not at my best, I show up with conflict, distancing, cut off over and under functioning, triangling, all of those things. But when I show up as my best, I'm able to manage my anxiety, be more calm, be more clearly defined, 
and stay connected with people, even if they see see things different than I do. Very good. Yeah, you that that is again. We need to have an addendum to the worksheet because you're already giving us <laughs> lists of additional things. Um, you know, one of the things that that we've talked a lot about anxiety as it relates to family, and the title of this talk really alludes to that. But I know one of the things in the study of family systems. Um, that I had when I was in seminary is how family systems manifest itself in the workplace, right? We're talking about mm -hmm. the holidays. And so sure. many of us are going to be having work holiday parties for the first mm -hmm. time in a while. And so people have a tendency to let their guard down. And then I know, you know, right now, everybody's trying to cram everything in for the end of the year and balance it with your personal life. And, you know, I think what's interesting about the two of you together is that, Ken, you work with pastoral leaders, you know, our future pastoral leaders, people who are in ministry in the faith communities. And then Akima, you're working with people um, in, in the work environment, which just happens to be the health environment. So mm -hmm. it's like you're both um, working with family systems that manifest in these different dynamics. Recently, an article came out that a lot of people have been forwarding to us about how that over 40% of pastors um, surveyed in the last couple of months have considered leaving ministry in mm -hmm. the last year. So yep. we see how that anxiety is in the our houses of worship. And then, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you had you, you had to have been completely cut off from humanity if you don't know the anxiety in the health community right now. So mm -hmm. my question to both of you is, how do we manage some of these things? How does How is this anxiety different and how do we cope with it in the workplace ra and it, you know, rather than just our home life? Because it's mm -hmm. interesting that we take on the same roles mm -hmm. that we do from our family of origin, from yep. our families, and then we transfer that into our place of work. Can you give us some tips, both of you, mm -hmm. on how do you transfer this knowledge that you have <laughs> to help people cope with their places of work, be it a house of worship or a clinical setting? Mm -hmm. Good question. Good, Akima, question. Why, don't, why don't you go first this time, would you? Sure, absolutely. Um, so you, you hit the nail on the head, Kim, uh, understanding where you are in a family really helps with where you are in your workplace, right? So I'm an only child. I'm a mom's only child, right? Understanding that a lot of times I need my space or I need to just uh, take care of the situation or even I can take my toys and go in the house and play by myself. <laughs> Whatever that means for an only child, it helps me on my job. It helps me in ministry, if you will. Um, and so uh, when there is anxiety around whatever's going on in the office, it helps to understand as an only child. Sometimes I don't understand sibling rivalries. Like I don't do rivalry well. Probably why conflict I didn't think was one of my biggest um, <laughs> go-tos beyond sarcasm. Um, but uh, you know, so understanding that I can go in a group in a, in, in, in a group at work um, or even in healthcare when you're trying to educate someone and I could almost pick where they sit in the family now right yeah. I could tell the firstborns right I can tell um, tell us what the firstborn looks like <laughs> well that firstborn's pretty bossy there <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. did I just put someone in a box did I just put them in a box no because we're all we're all on a journey here but no and I can tell who is the youngest in the family right sometimes the youngest sometimes not all the time sometimes the youngest can really be an under functioner right they want everyone to do it for them mm -hmm. right they'd rather just everyone make the decisions and then mm -hmm. you know go with, go along with the group but understanding how that plays out understanding uh, where you sit in your family to help deal with those issues and also um how how other how how my family reacts to anxiety right is typically how i may react to anxiety mm -hmm. right i'm not just cut off because i was born on this earth by myself and just appeared on earth and i just cut off what's my thing no when i went through faith walking or i'm going through faith walking with dr schumann one thing i learned is i can trace cut off all the way back to my great great grandmother great great grandmother right mm -hmm. and family and we mm -hmm. were some cutters 
right? But <laughs> understanding that, understanding that all the way through through this point in my life and our lives is very important. And so then I have to ask personal questions to myself by myself, you know, am I anxious because of what am I going to do? What am I going to re- am I going to respond by cutting off or like Ken just said, am I going to sit in this situation, control the anxiety within me? Right, it'd be very much in 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 the present, and allow them to be who they are, so that we don't mm-hmm. over overreact, so I don't over respond, so I don't over function. I can do it. I promise mm-hmm. you, I can do it. If you give it to me right now, Kim, I can do it. Right, mm-hmm. I am a doer. Right, <laughs> but I have to control that over functioning and just let it be. Yeah. Let it be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I I think the thing to remember, uh, Akima, that you highlighted is we are only responsible for ourselves. Absolutely. We, we can't be responsible for other people. And, and that's really important here during the holidays is I'm not, a, I'm not responsible for making anybody else happy. I'm only responsible for me. And, but I am responsible for me. And so I want to manage myself. I want to manage my anxiety. And I, I, want, I want to show up in ways that are my best self to the best of my ability. Uh, that that's a real key goal and one of the things that we get trapped in group is we get trapped in this thing of blaming other people mm-hmm. and and we're and we keep our focus on what other people are doing rather than what we are doing so here's a question for you this is one of the addendums kim uh, a question to always ask ourselves is this question what's my role in keeping this problem in place. Oh, we. Oui. Because you always have a role. Absolutely. It might be an active role or it might be a passive role. It might be that I'm not doing what I need to be doing, or it might be I am doing, I'm, I'm doing, but, but we always have a role. And if we could just discipline ourselves to ask that question, what's my role in keeping this problem in place? Well, my role is, I'm not telling anybody no. And so I'm, I'm, uh, I keep saying yes. And so I'm overwhelmed. That's my role. What's my role? Well, my role is I'm not telling people the truth. I'm not being honest and saying what's really true for me. And, and so I keep living with this anxiety. That's my role. I mean, on and on, we could go giving examples of that. But the question is, Workplace, wherever. So family systems, it's called family systems, but it applies to any system. It's, it's really emotional systems. So any, all emotional systems are just alike. Mm-hmm. And by the way, wherever there's people, there's emotion. Well, now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wherever there's people, there's emotion. So, so, we're, we're, so recognize we are all in multiple emotional systems. Yes, yes. Dr. Schumann, you said something I like to highlight when you talked about um, those, those those patterns and doing the same thing we've already done. Um, mm-hmm. And and one way, I, and you say, and, and my question first comes up was how do we how then how do we get out of the cycle, right? Mm-hmm. And the one coin term we use is you change the dance, right? Mm-hmm. I've been dancing yeah. this way the whole time, right? Mm-hmm. Now I got to change the dance. Right. I got to change. So if so, in my case, if I'm not speaking up for myself, if not if I'm not being authentic and mm-hmm. saying what's on my heart, then I get the same backlash. I get the same. Right. And so I choose to change the dance and speak up for myself, right? right. At the right time, at the right moment, with the right, right honor and respect that the Lord only gives me. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody gives a right out right here. A yeah. Good point. Mm-hmm. And Akima, I'm glad you brought that up uh, ab- about changing the dance. So, so here's another idea to, to hold group. When we start to work on ourselves, we will change the dance. So you'll change the dance at work. You'll change the dance in your relationship with the significant other people in your, you'll change the dance with your parents. If your parents are still around with your siblings. And here's the problem with changing the dance. When you change the dance, you start stepping on toes. Wow. (laughs) Okay. So recognize, hey, wait, I'm doing good here. I'm, I'm working on my anxiety. I'm changing the dance. I'm showing up different. Yeah, and guess what? And some others aren't going to like it. And, what they're, and, and you know what they want? They want you back in the old familiar dance. 
go back. So they're going to try to get you back into that old familiar dance. Because, why? Because, because changing the dance makes them anxious. Stay the same. Because, so, <laughs> so Kim, because now we've is, changed the dance. Yeah. So you Kim, used to be a, this way. I'm sorry, Kim. You used to no, be that way. Now you're changing. Yeah. Go for it, this Kim. Is a, this is a good segue um, into a question we have from one of our faith leaders. But before I get yeah. into her question, I just want to encourage everybody to use the, the chat box because um, you're sending those questions to me. And I would love to be able to offer those to our guests. So please use that chat box and, and ask me some questions. But one of our faith leaders asks, Okay, so based on what you just said, so you're going to change the dance, but a faith leader has a unique role. So how do they manage um, self-care, self-truth, and then their responsibility and role of deferring to the needs of others? Very good question. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's a great question. A really question. great question. And it's, and it's multi-layered. All right. So let me start with the, the thing I'm thinking about most. And, and here's another one of my phrases, okay? Um, we are responsible to others to love them well. Yes, yes, yes. We are not responsible for others mm -hmm. to take care of them. And I wish I'd known that 25, 30 years ago. I, I mean, I would have been a better pastor, uh, but, but I didn't. And, and as a result, so let me say, I, and, and I burnt out. Yeah. And, and the reason I experienced burnout, I burnt out and I quit. And the reason I experienced burnout was because I was taking responsibility for the feelings of all of my congregation. I, I thought, okay, I mean, I, I would never say it. And even when I said it, even if I said it, I wouldn't have believed I was doing it. But what I really was doing, if you, if you just get blunt and honest, is I felt like it was my responsibility to keep everybody happy. Yeah. Yes. And that's an impossibility. I don't care if you have 10 or 10,000. Yeah. <laughs> it's just impossible. And so learning, I think one of the first things that I would encourage people uh, and by the way, if, if, if it's a, a, a pastoral leader, I want to recommend an excellent book. If I could do that, may I do that here? Yes. Uh, there, there's a book called When All Else Fails. Great. And it's by a guy named Wayne Minking, M-E-N-K-I-N-G, Minking. And, and it helps uh, for you that are pastoral leaders apply family systems principles to pastoral leadership. I mean, that's what the book's about. It's a little paperback. It's pretty simple. Uh, I, I would encourage you to read it. But the, but the key principle in that is learning that we are not responsible for the, for the happiness or well-being or the anxiety of other people. So, so let, me, let me use that phrase. So, so I learned out of my first formation, in, it, not in my awareness, but, but, but I learned I'm responsible for my father's anxiety. And so therefore I've got to work 10 times as hard because I've got, I've got to make sure the environment stays calm because when my father gets anxious, I get hurt. And so then I took that into pastoral ministry as a, as a local church pastor. And I felt like, okay, I've got to make sure everybody in my organization so to, if, if you're not a church leader, take it into any organization. I'm responsible for keeping everybody, all the anxiety down here. I've got, I'm responsible for keeping my boss's anxiety down. No, I'm not. I'm responsible for my job description. I'm responsible for loving that person as well as I can love them. And I'm, I'm responsible then for myself, but that's all I'm responsible for. For me, that's a huge piece whether we're talking job, family, holidays, whatever, I'm not responsible for everybody else's anxiety. And I didn't get, but maybe a little bit excited there. So I better get calm and let Akima talk. No, you did absolutely wonderful, <laughs> but no, feeling responsible for other people though, really. Um, I, I am an only child. I did say that, right? Uh, only child of, of a, a hardworking, beautiful woman. And and by, by, by profession, I'm a registered nurse. So who takes care of people all day? Who gets paid to take <laughs> care of people, right? I have mm -hmm. a licensed 
by the state of Texas. I'm registered by the state of Texas as a registered nurse. They pay me good money to take care of people, but learning to, um, to let go or not take care of when it's not yours. You, you pointed out, I think we can say it a thousand times here, being responsible um, to people. I'm responsible to be nice, kind, caring, considerate. I'm responsible to help out. If I put it on my job, I'm responsible to pass medications on time, in time, get it done. I'm responsible to be the leader on my job that I am, right? Take care of my business, do it. I'm responsible. And how you feel about it? You thought I should have done this way versus that way, or um, or mm -hmm. or or I just I I just don't like this whole project that the whole company is working on. That that's I can't be responsible for that. I can't really, it is our uh, our objective by our CEO and we have a job to do, right? But I don't have to make everybody comfortable about that. Mm -hmm. No, that, not, not me, not me, right? What is my role in this? What is my role to this whole piece, to this whole puzzle? Very important and very key. And Kima, I think, um, and we kind of touched on this a couple of days ago that um, for me personally, I didn't realize what, the art of nursing really was until I married my husband and he has an aunt who has like three postdocs in nursing. And I was like, well, if you have three postdocs in nursing, aren't you a doctor? How are you, how are you a, still a nurse? I don't understand. And she said, no, 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 Kim, nursing is the art of healing. And so just listening to you talk right now, it makes me think that that is such a beautiful analogy for what y'all are talking about, because mm -hmm. As a nurse, you can't, you can't make somebody heal. Healing has to happen on your own, right? Mm -hmm. But you can give them the tools. You can help mm -hmm. them. And a lot of times the stuff you have to do as a nurse does not feel good for the other person, but you know that you have to do it to help them heal. And I think that idea of the art of healing that nurses give us is a great analogy for what we all have to do and helping each other cope with our own anxiety, right? You can help them, but you can't heal for them. No. I can't get out and change anyone's diet. I can't eat for them, right? I yeah. can't, I can't go to yoga for them so they can de-stress, right? I can't, I can't take the medication for them. I can't do anything for that but the art of healing i love that when you first brought it to me and and that's exactly what it is right we create a foundation and an environment that is healthy that is neutral right. so the person can heal i mean our bodies were created wonderfully and with the gift of science and with the gift of healing uh they they the healing can take place so yeah. absolutely i love that 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 terminology thank you for that well and we i don't want to run out of time before we get to your last 10 um suggestions dr schumann you gave us some great suggestions on managing our anxiety and you've touched on number four a lot which is taking mm -hmm. responsibility for yourself but mm -hmm. can you bring up just point out some of your favorites out of this list because we don't want to we don't want to pass those up before our time <laughs> yeah uh, well, they're really all important, but let me highlight number seven, uh, because one of the reasons for our anxiety, and if you don't have the sheet in front of you, here's what number seven is, Re refuse to make up a story in your head about what the other person's motives are. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, and we <laughs> talked about how that, okay. The biggest trigger for this, at least in my family, is what I like to call intergenerational texting. So for whatever <laughs> reason, the three matriarchs in my family who are all in their 70s, they swear they don't get text messages. And all the cousins were like, yes, you did. It's on the thread. Just look, Mimi. Look, Nana. Look, you know, and this intergenerational texting Next thing you know, Nana is sitting there imagining why she didn't know about this. And so she's got this story in her head. So I just want to caution everybody about intergenerational texting. It is a huge <laughs> trigger for this one right here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a lot of anxiety gets generated, group, because we, we, we invent a story in our head and are convinced it's true. Mm -hmm. Now, it may be true, but it also may not be true. 
Uh, it, it's about other people's motives or it's about what uh, other people, what happens to other people's. For me, where this one shows up is with my two adult daughters. They're both grown adults. They've, they've been in the, the, in the adult world for a good long while now, but, but daddy still worries about them. And when I don't hear from them in a certain amount of time that, you know, is my expectation of them, then I, what do I do? I make up a story in my head about what's going on. Oh, well, I, I know. Oh, my gosh. Uh, they've had an accident. Oh, my gosh. This happened or that. Happened. And I make up this story. So one of the ways to manage anxiety is to gather the facts and stick with the facts. Yes. Don't make up a story. Yes. Easier what said you than want to done. add to that, <laughs> Easier said than done. Very recently, <laughs> very recently in my cutoff family, um, I have an auntie who I love, and she she is my aunt, right? Um, and she just disappeared off the family text. She disappeared <laughs> off the face of family text and uh, changed her phone number. So oh my god! Really? Goodness. And so, the, so if I may inter interrupt, yes. that's that's some serious cutoff right there. <laughs> But here it is. When you I can't change even, your number. Change your number. I can't even call it that, right? Because I don't want to make up a story as to why. Mm -hmm. But there were a lot of stories circulating between my mom, uh, who I honor is on this call, my mom, my aunties, um, and some other people. Uh, oh, well, maybe she's doing this. Maybe she's doing this. And then she said, and I just, you know, we can't, we can't guess that. Now that's not fair. Now what? What? What was? Here's the other side of that. And so I did a lot of that conversation to try and calm everything down. We're not going to cut off because we've been cut off we're just going to give it time right and we're not going to come up with all that well she's probably mad because i said this and i said that and i can tell it and the, the it goes on kim i promise you your nana your mimi i could probably name my mom and her <laughs> sisters the same if you will uh but it does happen we, and that was that's a very recent uh, by the way she has resurfaced kind of sort of you know, around Thanksgiving time, we were all, I was ecstatic to hear from her, but nonetheless, she's fine. She said she needed to pray and hear. Okay. That's fantastic. Good. Yes. That's great. We have a, a question from the audience. I think this is great. Um, how do we remove our own emotional response to other people who we see harming themselves through the family dynamics. When we see other people in our family on that gerbil wheel of self-harm, yeah. emotional yeah. self-harm, how do we, you know, separate ourselves from that? Or do we? Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a great question. Um, so within family systems, there's there's a term called fusion. And with mm -hmm. the people we loved, we are we are fused to, okay, which which means so what it means is we can work and practice to be differentiated, to not take responsibility, but there's going to be an element that leaks into our lives. OK, especially with people that we don't that we really love who who are making horrible choices. If they are adults. Who who are fully functioning adults. I think the challenge becomes, uh, again, I want to love them well. And so I ask the question, what does loving them well look like? But I'm not responsible for them. And I can't manipulate them. I can't control them. I can't make the decisions for them. Those are theirs to make, even when I know they're making horrible choices. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and again, I mean, for me, the real world is my adult daughter. So what happens when one of my adult daughters is making choices that are not healthy and not helpful? Uh, I want to rush in. I want to be controlling daddy, right? I want to fix it for her. That won't help. And and so so it it brings up a completely and and we're out of time, so we can't go here. But it brings up a completely uh, uh, another idea, which is one of the ways we manage our anxiety is by increasing our our own tolerance for emotional discomfort within ourselves and within the people we love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so one author puts it this way. There's a difference between short-term hurt and long-term harm. Wow. Yes. Okay. So, so one of the, one, one of the practice fields for me is, can I increase my tolerance 
for my own emotional discomfort. So I know my daughter's struggling and I'm just using that as an example. Both my daughters are doing great. But if one of my daughters, I know they're struggling and I have to increase my own emotional tolerance for the anxiety that gets stirred up in me because I know they're anxious too. And so I allow them to struggle. And, and here's, here's the, the, the big piece of that, folks. If I rush in and fix it, they don't grow. No. Yeah. You see, when if, if I can increase my own emotional tolerance, whether that's at work or in a congregation or where it, with, within my family, I allow, I allow the other person to grow. I give them room to blossom. And guess what? When, because what am I doing? I'm forcing them to begin to take responsibility for themselves. And when people learn and begin, even when they're forced to, to have to, I've got to take responsibility for myself, they begin to grow up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's very good. That's very good. I like to add I thought to it that. was real good. First <laughs> that was very good. <laughs> you know, because we've had so many conversations over this. But when you, when you allow the other person to grow, then they get to uh, feel that feeling. Mm-hmm. They get to uh, feel when they are about to lose control before you take mm-hmm. over from them. They get to mm-hmm. feel what it's like um, to mm-hmm. to be saddened or or to be almost in depression. What does that feel like so that I can change my own behavior, but allowing the other person room to grow. It's okay if other people have emotions and we don't have to rescue them out of there. Kim, we can go on this for another 30 minutes or so. Mm-hmm. I'm going to cut mm-hmm. it off right there, though. It is very important. Go for it, Dr. But, but Akima, what that, so uh, there was something that we had thought about talking about, and I want to mention it here because you're, you're getting around it, is the effect physiological effects of that anxiety. Is it. Yes. Why don't you I talk was going to touch on that too. That? <laughs> that, that's where I was going to go before I cut it off. So thank you for bringing that back around and understanding what that looks like inside of our bodies, right? So yeah. a lot of people say, well, I'm not anxious. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm nice and calm. I'm not anxious, but they're walking out the door away from the group, right? I'm not <laughs> anxious. I'm not calm. Or they're cutting off or cussing out or going off mm-hmm. and, you know, flipping the bird or honking real hard and people cut them off. What does anxiety look like? Right. For me, when I know I'm getting anxious because I get these butterflies in my stomach and this pressure in my chest. Mm -hmm. And that's when I know the situation I'm in is about to make me do what I normally do when I'm in a a situation, which is for me, I've I've been very uh, uh, transparent. I cut off. Right. I will shut down, cut off. Give me a minute. Now, what I've done recently, though, if I can. I can come back in five minutes before it's gone. Wouldn't hear for it again. But physiologically, so respiratory system, your respiratory, you start breathing, right, heavy. Some people start breathing heavy. I've heard people say, um, and this is where your nerves come in, they feel the hair standing up on the back of their neck, right? Yeah. Um, heart palpitations, you can literally yeah. feel your heart pounding out of your chest. Someone saying something that you don't agree with, or they're very disappointing, and you feel a pounding on your chest, and your respirations get really short, and you don't quite know that you have sweaty palms and sweaty hands, yeah. all those. But your your body responds before your mouth even opens up. Mm-hmm. And when I'm teaching my children, and I say, "Well, what is your response?" When I'm teaching anxiety, well, I, I just ran away. That's when they're, I just I just ran away. No, that's the end effect. What happened before you ran away? And so now they're very conscious about what happens before I react, what happens before I, I overcompensate, I cut off, I distance, I overrun to travel, try, triangle, tell somebody else the story. Oh, my stomach starts getting queasy, mom. Mm-hmm. And that's the point. We need to change the dance, make a different mm-hmm. decision. do something. I've else. always thought that it feels like someone, I've, and I've said this before, it feels like somebody squirted a lemon in my stomach or like inside <laughs> my chest. You know, it's just that, that, that sour tingly feeling. And it feels like there's a lemon exploding mm-hmm. inside my tummy. Um, and I think this is a good, you know, we've only got four minutes and Dr. Schumann, you know, you've got number 10 here. Stop, yep, that's where I was going. <laughs> and think. Can you take yep. us out with that? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And what I would like to say, group, uh, I say back to the feeling, the physiological feeling, that's the early warning system that your body is telling you you're about to do what you always do when you get anxious. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you can recognize and figure out how do you feel physically when you get anxious? Mm-hmm. 
then that enables you to do something different. Yeah. And to do something different is a, is a simple little formula, three things. So when you get anxious at work, at church, at home, with your family, the first thing to do is stop. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just don't do what you've always done. Uh, in, the, in the movie Alice in Wonderland, I, I think I've <laughs> quoted the right movie. Yes. Uh, there's, a little, there's a little rabbit. And the little rabbit has a saying, don't just do something, stand there. Wow. <laughs> when you get anxious, don't just do something, something, stand there. If you do nothing, that's better than what you always do. Okay. So stopping yourself is about recognizing the, the, the way you feel physically and just stopping. Then the second word is calm. Stop calm. H how do I calm? Take a few deep breaths take a break, walk to the, go, go to the restroom. Uh, sometimes what, you know, when I'm with my family, I, I need more than just going to the restroom. I need to go to the grocery store. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, I, I, I need 15 minutes. Uh, and, but, but be, so I take responsibility for myself. And I do what I need to do to calm myself. I go for a walk outside. Let me just go for a walk. You see, I'm not changing the other people. I'm changing me by reducing my own anxiety and, and calming myself. And then the third word is think. And, and the think is about, okay, so when we get anxious, we get stupid. We're, we're not even going to go into all the science of that, but we get <laughs> stupid. We just, we quit listening and when we quit thinking. So what I want to do is I want to get the thinking part of my brain going again. And one of the ways to do that, and I know we, we were in our last minute, uh, so y'all better listen a little faster, okay? Because I, I got more to say. Uh, the, when uh, thinking is about how do I want to show up? And one of the suggestions that I mentioned in the material is write yourself a guiding principle while you're calm about how you want to show up at the Christmas mm -hmm. party or with your family, or uh, at, at the outing you're going to, and, and just a, a short, little, small, this is how I want to show up. And the thinking is reminding yourself of your guiding principle about, hey, this is how I determined when I was calm, how I wanted to show up at this meeting. Done. In Done. time. Yay. Thank you so much, <laughs> both of you. you. This has been Absolutely. fun. I have had a great time talking to you and I know I could keep going and going because y'all are just a breath of fresh air and you're energizing and full of great ideas. So thank you both so, so much. Um, I just also want to thank everyone in our audience for being with us today. Please stay tuned to Interfaith Ministries. Go to our website and find out when our next series of Vital Conversations will be happening in 2022. And again, I just want to thank Sitco Petroleum Corporation for sponsoring this uh, entire series that we've had. So thank you very much. And remember this discussion and all the others that we've had prior to today are on the Interfaith Ministries website under our Interfaith Relations and Community Partnerships page. Um, again, we have lots of things that we have opportunities for you to get involved in with our Afghan refugees, holiday bags for Meals on Wheels, and also we have a lot of job openings right now at Interfaith Ministries, particularly with our refugees as we welcome our newest neighbors to Houston. And all of our friends in the audience who are of the Jewish faith. Happy Hanukkah. And thank you, everyone. Once again, have a wonderful and less anxious day.